will call our regular meeting of the school board to order. Terry, can you please confirm that we're in compliance with our open meeting laws? Yes, we are. Thank you. And if you could please conduct the roll. Commissioner Nordeen. Here. Commissioner Zerv. Here. Commissioner Bika. Here. Commissioner Clements. Commissioner Farrar. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Lyons. Here. We'll now move on to our Pledge of Allegiance. Everett Velchik is a fifth grader in Ms. Greer's class at Putnam Heights Elementary School. He's eager to learn and loves to participate in class. He especially loves math. I'm excited about that personally. That's editorial. It's not in the uh, copy here and is not afraid to push and challenge himself. He often takes on extra math tasks just for fun. Everett has signed up to be a safety patroller and has started his first shift as a crossing guard. He takes this role seriously and keeps his fellow Putnam Panthers safe on their way to school. Everett loves sports and enjoys playing football and basketball with many of his peers at recess. Everett, if you could come forward to lead us, those of you who are willing and able, please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Everett. We now hear a motion to adopt tonight's agenda. Summoned. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? The agenda is approved. We start our meetings as always with our recognition segment. For that, I will turn it over to Superintendent Johnson. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Chair Nordine, board members, student representatives, and distinguished guests. Uh, we have four of them this evening with two presentations at the very end. Uh, first is National School Psychology Week. The theme for this year's celebration is Together We Shine. There are currently over 1,100 school psychologists working in Wisconsin schools, partnering with families, teachers, school administrators, and other professionals to create safe, healthy, and supporting supportive learning environments that strengthen connections between home, school, and the community. School psychologists apply expertise in mental health, learning, and behavior to help children and youth succeed academically, socially, behaviorally, and emotionally. They are also important members of school safety and crisis teams. We are so appreciative of all our district school psychs and the work they do with students, families, and staff. Secondly, we have National Native American Heritage Month. In August of 1990, President Bush had declared the month of November as National American Heritage Month. During this month, we celebrate indigenous peoples past and present and rededicate ourselves to honoring tribal sovereignty, promoting tribal self-determination, upholding the United States Solemn Trust, and treaty responsibilities to tribal nations. Last year, the South Middle School's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee proposed that they intentionally provide information for their school community to learn about different cultures and or historical moments. South now has two displays dedicated to celebrate the rich and diverse culture, history, and contributions of the Native people. These displays were put together by South Cons Counselor Roberta Koska and our district's Native American coordinator, Erica Mitchell. Erica shared her own personal collection and resources from the district collection of library books. Morning announcements at South provide information about Native American Heritage Month, Wisconsin's First Nations, and highlights items from the display cases. Trevor Cola, South Middle Principal, is here tonight to accept this recognition. Third this evening, we have the Sherman Socktober Service Project. Last month, Sherman Elementary kicked off its second annual Socktober Service Project. This is a drive to collect socks, which are the number one requested item at homeless shelters. With winter coming, Sherman students felt that it was important to help keep people's hearts and feet warm while building skills such as organizing, planning, time management, communication, and collaboration. Students set a goal of 3,500 pairs of socks and raised 2,369 pairs of socks. The socks will be donated to organiza organizations throughout the Eau Claire community, including families at Sherman, and the Eau Claire Area School District. Tonight, we are joined by fifth grade Sherman teacher, Brianna Henry, who started Socktober, as well as Principal Alicia Kirkman, Assistant Principal Lori House, and student Leland Smith. Leland, I'm glad, glad you showed up tonight. <laughs> and finally, our Veterans Day programs. Friday, November, November 11th is Veterans Day. 
On this day, we pause to honor those who have served and thank them for all they have done for our country and community. Each of our schools will be holding a Veterans Day program. Descriptions of these programs have been posted on our website. In addition, this information will be posted on our social media and shared with local media. The district salutes our veterans and thanks them for their courage, dedication, and service. So uh, I've got two presentations, one with Mr. Kolop from South Middle and the other for our Sherman Elementary School team. We'll now move on to our public forum. The board provides community members up to four minutes to address the board at our meetings. The board does not hear personal complaints of school personnel nor any person connected with the school system in a public forum. I will interrupt you if you uh, go over your four minutes and I'm sorry for that. I will also pre apologize if I uh, mispronounce anyone's name. Our first uh, please just come forward uh, to speak. Our first speaker tonight is Judy Olson. I'm right here. Yep. Yeah. My computer here. Okay. No, that's. Going to put my cane here. Uh, good evening. Good to see you all. Um, Erica and Markel, Phil, Michael, uh, Superintendent Michael, and Dr. Tim Norton, Dr. Markel Johnson, and Dr. Stephanie Far Fair, Far Far Ar, and Dr. Lori Bika. Um, I just want to let you know I pray for you guys every pray for you every day. And um, the reason I come here, I don't have any notes, so you're gonna have to tell me if I go over time. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I came here last May, and I just said I told you that I was um, helping out in the schools. This was a few years back, and I was called into the health um, eighth grade health class, and uh, they. Well, it was shocked me that they talked about the private parts between young girls and young boys. And um, it disturbed me. And so I came here and um, then you said it would take it on to the teaching and learning department, which you did. And and I talked with, can I mention someone I talked to? I can't mention, I mean, nothing bad. I think, you, I think you, you're probably safest to just okay. to, okay. That you, you did have that. Well, I thought, anyway, she was not working here anymore. She didn't, I said, she, she said she might, Put it into computers, you know, and so they'd be separate. And then I call, and I said, well, let's let me know what goes on. And uh, so I, she didn't call me back, and I called in August, no answer, no answer. So then I came here on Friday, and they said she wasn't a lo no longer working. So then they, I went and spoke with somebody else, and um, I told her, you know, my history, and she said, um, well, they don't want to, they don't want to separate the boys and the girls because they don't, they want them to get used to the stigma. I guess that's talking about private parts in front of everyone between. And um, I just, and I know there's other stuff that goes on. You know, I know it's done with young children and stuff like that, and I'm not gonna go into that. But um, I, I, I look at things from an eternal view. I mean, you know, we're all gonna be, we can't, live here forever we know we're going to end up everyone go, go, dies at some point we go somewhere <laughs> so um we need to answer our creator and um does say i'm just going to read some some verses here um 
does say here, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now, what do you say suppress the truth? The truth is that Jesus loves everybody. It's the truth. He loves every one of you. He loves me. And, and you're so special. Everyone's so special in his eyes. And, um, and then... Um, um, I also want to read this. It is it is inevitable that stumbling blocks should come, but woe to him who, through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. And to stumble is to, well, not to come to the truth. And we all have to repent. I have repented. I mean, nobody's perfect. Yeah. If we come to the uh, holy God, we have to repent. And um, then I'd like to read um, John 3.16. Maybe you're familiar with this. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave us only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We have eternal life. This is also that's your time. Next up is Michael Shubin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, my name is Technical Sergeant Michael Scubin. I'm an Air Force recruiter. Been here about uh, 16 months. I'm joined with uh, Sergeant Johnson. Today. Excuse me, back there, he's my office partner. Um, so I come with you with a issue that we have with recruitment. <clears throat> uh, if you've seen the news lately, a lot of our branches of the military have been struggling to meet numbers. Uh, Air Force was able to hit their goal for the fiscal year this year, but barely. We didn't have enough people. So one of the big concerns myself and Sergeant Johnson have seen is that within the Eau Claire School District, primarily Memorial and North High Schools, we're stuck in student services. Now, all of you have been in the world for a long time, you've seen all of different marketing that is out there, and we are not being used effectively in those schools being stuck in student services. When they make an announcement over the PA, especially during lunchtime or at the end of the day, the last thing that these students want to do is go talk to a recruiter, especially if it's between pizza and talking to some old crusty tech sergeant from the Air Force about the benefits of the Air Force. Um, I say that jokingly, but in all seriousness, we are trying desperately to give people opportunities that myself and Johnson, or Sergeant Johnson have seen tenfold. He's been able to see the world. He's seen 64 different countries in his career in 16 years. I've only seen like five or six, but they were pretty cool countries. I'll be honest with you. Um, so I've talked with some of the leaders in some of these different schools and really the problem is this policy. And what I wanna know is why. We have other schools outside of the Eau Claire School District that allow us to be in the lunchroom and this is just all recruiters. I'm trying to help out my brothers and sisters in the other services. Why are we stuck in student services? The board doesn't respond during. Oh, the board doesn't. OK, so I, I don't know if you're I'm waiting for <laughs> Sorry. a dramatic pause, but I <laughs> let's. Um... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, OK, so now I understand the forum. Got it. Um, so our biggest concern is, again, trying to get people in the Air Force. And really, it's a, it comes down to marketing. Really just having the Air Force symbol, the Marine Corps symbol, the Navy, the Army, and even the Coast Guard if they want to show up every once in a while. Um, so I would like you to please consider that policy is a change. We're not going to go in there and start yelling at kids. We're not drill instructors. Uh, I might seem big and scary. I'm not. I'm a big teddy bear. I'm married. I got two kids, a little Boston Terrier named Banks. You know, hang out with Sergeant Johnson. We play Frisbee golf and maybe have a Wisconsin beer every once in a while. Um, but we just want to get in front of these students to help not only national defense, but then also help make lifelong decisions. What I would like to see is some of these students serve in the military, preferably the Air Force, go do their time that four or six years and come back to University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, use their post 9-11 GI Bill and not have any college debt. Be a contributing member to this community and to do that all throughout the world. Or maybe they do their 20 plus years like what I'm going to do and retire and then come back here to Eau Claire because I think that's the biggest issue I have with recruiting here. It's too darn nice. 
Am I wrong? <laughs> Low crime rates, good schools, nice people, cheese curds. Come on, let's be honest here. It's a great place to live. Um, but we really just want to talk to these students and help. Whether they want to serve in the military or not, I don't want us to be seen as people who handcuff children to airplanes and send them off to war. We're not in Afghanistan anymore, not like we used to. We want to help, whether it's just through leadership and guidance or helping them go into their branch of service. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. That ends our public forum for the evening. We'll now move on to our regular reports and we'll start as always with the referendum committee. Commissioner Lyons. Uh, the referendum committee has not uh, met, but there has been ongoing informational activity and I would like to yield my time to the superintendent to uh, give a summary. Thank you. Uh, just in sharing our, our committee update this evening, I, I'd just like to mention the following. Uh, we had started presenting to schools in uh, mid-September, as I've said to, to many groups. Our, our staff is the most important to inform about a referendum, uh, and we've had approximately 80 formal presentations with various stakeholder groups in town. Um, although it's been quite a time, a time commitment, um, we've certainly enjoyed connecting with the community. I hope our goals are realized of addressing our aging buildings, providing a great learning environment for our students and staff, and continuing to invest in our buildings to benefit all. Uh, the information is out there. Uh, it's been mailed twice, emailed, shared on social media, live streamed, presented in public, placed in folders and shown on TV. But uh, we still meet with any groups or individuals to inform or answer questions. And I, I think I shared with our staff up until 7.59 tomorrow evening um, when the polls are close to closing, but please exercise your right to vote. Uh, I would like to recognize some folks this evening, uh, our referendum informational planning team, our schools, Market and Johnson, our PTOs, Eau Claire service organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, the supporter of Eau Claire Public Schools, neighborhood associations, any person who's attended any of our presentations, TV 13 and 18, and those community members who took time to meet with us and to ask questions of us and to seek understanding as well. Um, our next met meeting of a referendum committee would address either one of the two outcomes, future planning if the referendum does pass or future planning if it doesn't pass. Uh, furthermore, steps will be taken to address an indicator to meet our operational expectations of budget and financial planning for roadmaps in the future referenda, capital as well as operational. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to our legislative liaison, Dr. Johnson. On October 15th, the Department of Public Instruction released its certified state general school aid amounts that each school district will receive during the current 2022-2023 school year. General school aids are the largest form of state support for pre-K-12 schools in Wisconsin and are based on student counts and year-end financial data from the prior school year. The bulk of general school aid comes in the form of equalization aid, which is distributed according to a formula the formula hasn't been updated since early 1990s that considers local differences in property wealth per pupil. Uh, ECD, ECASD saw an increase of 6.44%. This increase in general aid seen by all of the 294 districts with increases will be go towards offsetting local property taxes rather than increasing school budgets or pu per pupil spending. There will be 42 school district referenda on the November 8th ballot seeking authority to increase revenue limit operating revenues. That is in addition to the 50 such questions that have already gone before school district voters this year. The 92 referendum seeking additional operating revenue is the highest total ever in a single calendar year. The large number of revenue limit referenda is not surprising given the recent history of frozen revenue limits and high inflation that has existed. There has been no per pupil increase in revenue limits in six of the past eight years. When you add in the 74 ballot questions asking for authority to issue debt for facilities related projects, the total number of school district referenda questions is the highest it has been since calendar year 2000, when 192 school district referenda of all types took place. A report from the Educational Law Center finds Wisconsin school districts collectively faced a bill of $1.25 billion in unfunded special education costs for the 2020-21 uh, school year, even after accounting for state, 
special education reimbursement, and federal IDEA funds. The re report calls on the state to significantly boost the reimbursement rate for special education to enable districts to retain revenue in the general fund, which is used to actually supplement a special education fund and increase spending on essential programs and service for all students, including those with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. We have one additional report this evening, and that is the board president report. Uh, I'm going to there's two items tonight that I'd like to talk about. First was touched on by Superintendent Johnson. Election day is tomorrow. It encourages everyone to make sure that they get out and vote if you have not already cast the ballot. Secondly, when one election finishes, uh, the next one more or less begins anymore. And the uh, Commissioner Zur and myself will be hosting the board's annual how to run for school board uh, informational session next Thursday. 17th at 7 p.m. here at the school board office. Uh, anyone who is interested in learning more about how to become a candidate for the upcoming school board election is welcome to attend. We'll have all the forms necessary uh, to fill out and declare your candidacy, as well as talk about the work of the board and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, so uh, vote tomorrow and think about running for office in the spring. Next, we'll move on to tonight's consent agendas. For each of the consent agendas, the board acts with a single vote without discussion. Each of the items on the agenda, the board has discussed at a previous meeting or received information ahead of time. If any member wants to discuss a single item, it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and voted on separately. We'll start at all, as always tonight with the superintendent's consent agenda. Items on the superintendent's consent agenda include human resources, employment report, Gifts in the amount of $15,718.07 for the period of September 1st, 2022 through September 30th, 2022. Payments of all bills in the amount of $6,819,741.67. And net payroll in the amount of $6,647,563.25 for the period of September 1st, 2022 through September 30th, 2022. Increase in subpay. I would like to pull item 6.5. Thank you. So 6.5 will be pulled from the consent agenda. Uh, moving on with the rest of the consent agenda, approved transportation contract and board of canvassers appointees. At this time, I would hear a motion to approve the superintendent's consent agenda without 6.5. Second. Okay, when you're ready, uh, please conduct a roll call vote. Commissioner Nardine? Yes. Commissioner Zur? Yes. Commissioner Bika? Yes. Commissioner Clements? Yes. Like he's on here. Commissioner Farrar? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. At uh, this time, we'll move on to individually considering item 6.5 increase in sub pay. Uh, Commissioner Lyons, I will turn it, turn it to you first for discussion. Okay. Thank you. So, I've pulled the increase in substitute pay for a couple of reasons, and the first is budgetary. So two weeks ago, this board um, approved the district's operating budget, and today we have a request uh, to approve funding that's outside of that budget. There's a, a, a static question, a question that re reoccurs on board items uh, on a regular basis. And that's it asks the board, um, does this item fit within the budget? So I interpret that question uh, to mean, is it included in the budget? Yes or no? Um, if the answer is no, for me, that is when it's a one time expense. So if a, a boiler breaks down or something that is a one time expense within this year and not included in future budgets, then the the board would see that that is something that is not included. If it's an ongoing expense, which oftentimes is salary increases, it would be marked as yes, because we need to include it in this budget and all of the future budgets here on out. So I appreciate the changes that, that, that were made. Um, I understand that uh, we would be voting on something and acknowledging that um, it adds to the deficit that we that we voted on previously. So I, I'm good with that. The second uh, item really is about priority. 
And this is uh, an area where the $96,000 that we're looking at, it's not, a, it's not a big amount, but it is about the priority of ongoing um, allocations of personnel dollars. So personally, I acknowledge that we have difficulty in finding um, substitute teachers. I think, it's, I think it's a problem. But I'm also very concerned uh, that the district has not done uh, or really hasn't done anything with, with increments for a very long time. And so when we were approving uh, the referendum, one of the things that came up was about increments, those, those stipends, those payments that we make to coaches uh, of music, of athletics, um, of theater, uh, those kinds of things. And those increments have not changed for 15 years. So essentially what, what is occurring here is that um, a portion of district staff uh, compensation has not moved since 2008, I believe. Now, this is where I think um, we really miss that budget committee, because where do we prioritize the allocation of dollars that that for this is for substitute pay? But in, in previous board meetings, we've had two different market uh, adjustments for um, categories of, of, of district staff. And if you roll it all up, it's, it's over a million dollars. So where is it without that, that, that ability to have a budget committee? Where do we talk about what those priorities are for, for these personnel dollars that um, when we approve it, in, in 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 action items like this, they they will they they will occur forever. So when we do um, an allocation of ninety six thousand or a half a million, it's for this fiscal year and all of the fiscal years that 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 follow. And personally, I think that the increment issue is a larger issue than the substitute pay. And what I would really like to, to, to hear as, as a board member is that we're dealing with that as a priority because for me, that issue um, is a much larger one than trying to get to the top of the scale in this area in substitute pay. I would like to think that we could take these resources, no matter how big they are, and start to chip away at what I think is a much larger issue in the fact that um, there's, there's coaches out there that haven't had an increase in their compensation for the work that they do outside the classroom since 2008. So I'm going to vote no against this. It's not that I, that I don't think that the substitute pay is important. But in the priority, um, I don't think it's an, as, as important as something that we really ought to be uh, tackling at this point. So I would yield. Yeah. Any other discussion on this item? Commissioner Clements, sorry, go ahead, Commissioner Zer. Uh, I was just noting his presence, not he we didn't ask for the floor. Please go ahead. Um, so I'm I'm kind of torn right down the middle uh, uh, lines because I, I can see completely what you're saying. And I agree with the 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 premise of the budgetary like the the priorities and how we're setting those and where you know who is setting those priorities and is that our and so I think the question comes down to is that something that the board wants purview over? Is that something that we want to be, uh, you know, setting um, for the district? I think right now it is the implied, um, it, it maybe the, the implication is that the, the administration is setting those priorities for us, to, you know, based on the need that they're seeing within staffing internally. 
that's just my assumption. Um, but, you know, so, and, and I would argue that perhaps we don't have necessarily the boots on the ground observe, you know, like view of what's happening. That said, you know, day to day, like what really is the highest need? And, and if we are going to use up precious long-term dollars or add to our deficit for something, it's probably going to be really important, right? Um, and I don't know that I have day-to-day -day knowledge of what those things priorities exactly are. Um, now, that's not to say that in a budget committee type of environment, you wouldn't get down, you wouldn't boil it down to that. And so I, I can see your argument where, um, but I think the question then becomes not necessarily, you know, do I agree or disagree with this? Because I'm always going to agree that staff deserve a raise in education. If you're never going to find me disagreeing with that. And I think that, you know, substitutes are in front of our kids. They're, you know, working with our special education population. They're responsible for core content, which, you know, we really, we really need to have quality people in the room and we need to attract the best of our region, right? So I can see how this is a priority, um, but I can also see how increment would be a priority. Uh, so, you know, I think I would agree that budget development might be a pathway for us to better access information and, and at least advise in setting those priorities. Um, but I'm not sure it, it creates a disagreement. I'm not sure I want to hold this up for that. I think I agree with that part, but I also maybe agree with the raise. Dr. Johnson. So I, 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 I will support this particular item. Uh, however, given uh, uh, Commissioner Lyons' concerns, I, I for me, uh, I, I guess if we're uh, forecasting a particular future, I, uh, uh, I would not uh, be in favor of initial vote and or uh, uh, if the next budget that presented to us does not actually include actually the particular concern, long-term concerns about uh, uh, addressing actually a 15-year hold the own increments and I, I think that should be uh, that should be I, I also would argue that uh, uh, probably as soon as we potentially uh, adopt and make this particular change I assume that actually other area uh, 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 districts that actually potentially have issues as it pertains to sub pay will actually then adjust uh, their, their salaries accordingly which will require us to Re-examine not only this issue but others, and so you know I, I I'll, I'll vote in favor, but I also uh, you know I think forecasting in the future I would request in that the administration bring towards us in this overall budget that we are required to approve uh, annually uh, 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 particular information uh, that was uh, uh, brought forth by uh, Commissioner Lyons. Thank you. Seeing no other requests for the floor, I would hear a motion to approve increase in sub pay. So moved. Second. And Terry, whenever you're ready, you can conduct a roll call vote. Commissioner Nordine? Yes. Commissioner Zur? Yes. Commissioner Bika? Yes. Commissioner Clements? Yes. Commissioner Farrar? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? No. Motion is approved. We will now move on to the board's consent agenda. The board's consent agenda tonight includes minutes of closed session October 17th, 2022, minutes of board meeting October 17th, 2022, minutes of budget hearing October 24th, 2022, American Education Week proclamation changes to board policies, and changes to district policy 188. I would hear a motion to approve the board's consent agenda. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda is approved. We'll now move on to our regular focus on results segments. Tonight, we will hear from Dr. Zhang, Mr. Oldenburg, Mr. Olson on 
creating and sustaining a supportive learning environment. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. John. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about something that is very near and dear to our hearts with regards to working in school districts. And I thank my colleagues, uh, Mr. Dave Oldenburg and Mr. Derek Olson for joining me this evening. So tonight we focus our attention on board operational expectations number four, which is to establish and maintain environments that are safe, healthful, equitable, inclusive, non-discriminatory, respectful, and conclusive to learning for students and staff. I will briefly share the work that we are currently engaged in as a school district to support our students as connected to our teaching and learning strategic plan and the EMLSS. This work is grounded in the implementation that we talk about often within the EMLSS with respect to creating supportive learning environments for all students through social and emotional learning and supports. We know that social and emotional learning along with academics are developments that are interdependent of one another. We know that they're essential to success in school, in the workplace, at home, and in the community. Their integration improves our school climate as well as teacher effectiveness, and children benefit regardless of where they live, their socio uh, socioeconomic status, and their racial and ethnic backgrounds. Our goal is to support building leadership teams and principals to create the infrastructure and the organizational spaces that are needed to support the integration and implementation of social and emotional learning through sustainable and evidence-based practices so that all students have culturally responsive and supportive learning environments in which to grow and thrive. Our focus tonight is mainly on tier one, the practices and the work that we create that will impact at least 80% of our students at the universal level. I will share the PBIS, uh, the PBIS framework that we use focused on using data, systems and practices to guide the work of our SCL um, social and emotional work to support our creative learning environments. And then I will turn it over to Dave and Derek to share the work that they have been doing at Memorial High School to create supportive learning environments for our students there. These are the objectives that we hope to be able to share with you tonight. I'll give you just a second to read through those. And in essence, what we really hope to be able to do is to just share a glimmer of the work that we are currently engaged in to create a supportive learning environment through our social and emotional supports for all of us, our, all of our students with you. As a very quick review, I want to bring you back to our October 3rd meeting where Mandy Van Vliet um, shared our work with the equitable multi-level systems of supports with you. This is our guiding light. This is the framework that we use to ground our staff understanding and expectations for social and emotional learning braided with academic content in all three tiers of this framework. The framework, as you can see, creates a layered approach to meeting the needs of all students, regardless of where they are in their learning journey. Implementing an equitable multi-level system of supports means that students receive what they need in terms of equitable services, practices, and resources when they need it. Schools provide varying types of supports at differing levels of intensity to proactively and responsively adjust to the needs of the whole child. This framework is our response to the needs of the learning um, student in the Eau Claire School District. As you have already seen within the EMLSS, the teaching and learning department has developed a strategic plan to implement this framework. The strategic plan considers these five critical key features of guaranteed and viable curriculum, high quality instruction, collaboration, strategic assessments, and family and community engagement. These key features are interconnected systems that impact each other. Therefore, we know that systems work takes time because we need to provide professional learning and time for our staff to build new skills and practices to be utilized. When implemented to fidelity, outcomes for our students will improve but we know that it will take us some time to get there because this is systems level work, not work that we do um, on the surface. Again, the strategic plan has two focus areas, um, focus area one and focus area two. The work that we will be talking about primarily tonight um, focuses on the universal level of support for our students. And again, this is where we talk about creating an experience so that all of our learners receive good first teaching based on academic standards, behavioral, social, and emotional expectations within a supportive learning environment. 
which is the work that we are talking about tonight. Within the EMLSS, we use the PBIS framework in our district to apply the expectations and the work of Focus One with regards to social and emotional learning to create the supportive environments that we need. As you can see on this slide, we talk about using things um, that we have within our framework that are data, systems, and practices, and they're all interconnected to create an equitable and supportive learning environment for all students that is safe, positive, proactive and predictable. Within this framework, we ask that adults use data to inform the systems that will allow them to have effective practices be in place. On the other hand, students benefit when our adults are able to teach, model and reinforce social and emotional skills so that all students see, feel and can learn within safe environments. To have a deeper understanding of the PBIS framework, I will briefly break down um, each of those components just real quickly here for all of you. Um, first, we take a look at data. Data is very important in the work that we do because data is what helps us to drive the work as adults and the systems that we have to put in place. To know how to respond, staff need to use system level data as well as student data to inform the work within their system. An example of the district level data that we use to inform our system and practices is the tiered fidelity inventory or the TFI. This is a system assessment each school completes yearly. In addition to systems data, we also take a look at student data such as attendance, the youth risk behavior survey and student engagement survey data to, anal to be analyzed and then to form an appropriate response to the needs of the student in our district and in individual buildings. This slide is just a small example of some of the data pieces that we use to inform our work. This work, this data is actually from the most recent YRBS that has already been shared with you. This is an example of the student voice impacting the work that we are currently engaging in. Again, just YRBS data from the most recent assessment. Next, we look at systems as part of our PBIS framework. Systems are needed based on the data for our adults to be effective. The focus is on organizational structures and professional learning to support staff with readiness and skill development to teach, model, and reinforce SEL skills to create a supportive learning environment. As part of our professional learning this year, all of our school leadership teams, as a matter of fact, will start tomorrow, um, will engage in a professional learning opportunity through a customized implementation supports model that will be led by a national trainer to help st uh, staff and leadership teams with will and skill development to focus on SEL implementation in our schools. This will be a five, um, we will have five sessions throughout the school year, and the expectation is that leadership teams will come to the training. They will then turn around and go back into their buildings and hopefully be able to use those same skills with their staff, come back and learn some new practices and skills, and then be able to also go back into the buildings and share that throughout the school year. Again, you have seen the data on this slide before as we had shared this with you um, from R3. This brief example um, is a system level data that shows baseline for PBIS implementation in our schools. So the implementation of the PBIS framework of using data, system and practices is critical to the work of social and emotional learning. As a result, we have shared with you that the goal is for all of our schools in Eau Claire to be a full implementation at tier one by May of 2024. Our last component in the PBS framework is practices. This is where students experience, develop, or build skills that are needed to be successful in school, at home, and in the community. Explicit SEL instruction occurs within character strong and PBI or purposeful people lessons. DPI SEL competencies have been purposefully crosswalked with all of our character strong and purposeful people lessons. In addition, we are working towards integration of SEL competencies in several other curricular areas in the district. Currently, SEL competencies are integrated throughout our academic and career planning lessons, physical education, health, and within teachers' unit uh, lesson plans. This slide is an example of a ninth grade ELA unit plan. As teams of teachers collaborate to plan units, SEL competencies have been integrated as part of their academic units. 
Teachers need to be intentional about the specific SEL competency that they will teach, model, and reinforce during a unit of study. What you see here is a small portion of the unit plan referencing SEL competencies within that unit. This is an, another example of the intentional work of one of our curricular areas where SEL is integrated. The physical education department has begun the work to align their PE standards to specific SEL competencies within each unit. Moving forward, all PE teachers will be expected to collaborate and to write unit plans that align their academic standards to specific SEL skills for all of their lessons. Again, this is another example of how SEL competencies are integrated within the school day and within unit lesson plans. And finally, we come back to taking a look at the PBIS framework that grounds the critical components we need to use to create supportive learning environments for all of our students. Our work at the universal level is to focus on positive school culture as a priority. Using this research-based framework, focusing on data, systems, and practices, is critical to improving the student outcomes that we want for all of our children. The teaching and learning department continues to facilitate the process to intentionally embed SEL competencies throughout all curricular areas, but this will take time for us to get through all of our areas. Professional learning opportunities such as coaching, mentoring, collaboration, and training are provided to support teachers in their responsibilities to integrate SEL competencies into their daily lesson plans to create supportive learning environments for all students. And next, I will turn it over to Dave and Derek to share the work that they have been doing at the building level to create supportive learning environments for all of our old apes. Thanks, Kaying. It's a pleasure tonight to be able to break a little bit about Memorial High School and some of the things that we've been able to do at our building in partnership with their teaching and learning uh, department to better bring SCL competencies um, to the universal level for all staff and students. It's really an example, and Derek is going to talk about the details in, the, in a moment, but it's really an example of some of the strong shared leadership and organizational structures we've been able to um, embed in advance here in our building um, in partnering with our staff in polling our students in better using data to inform the instruction in SCL and the SCL competencies that are being articulated, we've been able to set up a continuous improvement cycle to allow all students to have access to those universal SCL competencies identified by Castle and carried through uh, through the Character Strong curriculum that we have, and then also partnering with our staff to better. Um, better uh, train, deliver, and give confidence to our staff to be able to, through pedagogy and through instructional practices in their classroom, to bring to life the embedded portions that Tang talked about with a great example of the uh, curriculum and instruction guide um, guide that she shared a, a couple of months ago. So one of the things that we really pride ourselves about is that continuous improvement model of plan, do, study, and adjust. And, and Mr. Olson's gonna talk a bit about what it looks like, the routine of SCL um, education and training at the Universal Level at our building, and then some of the data that we use to better form our instruction. Yeah, thanks Dave and thanks board um, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I've been on, I was on the district SEL committee two summers ago and got to see firsthand the work that was done there uh, to try to to build a framework that we knew was going to be successful for all buildings, um, kindergarten through 12th grade. And that's a big job, right? Because we, we have a lot of needs um, and a lot of different age groups. And to be able to think how how is you know each particular building in our district going to be able to successfully move kids um, to a place where we can feel that all students feel safe to walk in um, and valued for for you know the uniqueness that they bring um, every day as well as just making sure that they have a sense of belonging in the school it's a big task and a big lift and we would love to be able to just snap our fingers and say that yep we're there and we did it and everything's great um, but what 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 I've learned personally is that systems change does take time. And so what we we took from the committee, um, you know, the recommendation to move forward with character strong, that was a that was a staff K through 12 decision. I felt valued in that decision um, as we move forward. I think that other members of that committee would tell you 
um, the same. And we we brought it to Memorial and thought this is going to be great. And what we what we learned fast is that it's it it takes time to change um, things that have never been done before. And so we implemented and we were working on it and we continuously um, gathered feedback um, from both students and staff and have continued to kind of work on how does this look at Eau Claire Memorial? What can we do to make sure that students are engaging in this work and that staff are being brought along in their abilities to um, to teach these competencies to all students? Um, we know that embedding these threat, these competencies into the actual classroom is where the rubber really hits the road for high school students. Um, and also there's a place for a standalone um, social emotional learning to occur. And so we currently have a model where all all staff and all students are able to um, enter into standalone uh, SEL character strong lessons. Um, and we're trying to do it in such a way that the feedback that we've gained from students and staff is being uh, listened to and that we're moving along at a pace that is allowing all to to be successful. So one of the things that that um, to add here that um, John Hattie's research tells us is one of the most powerful things that you can do for students, especially adolescent students, is to allow them to be a portion of and and contribute to their own learning. And Derek's got a real interesting example of some of our senior leaders, including Representative Lester and some of the um, uh, positions that they've taken in the building to do some uh, peer education and leadership. Yeah, so we have 60 seniors currently, which is a, a, a large number, uh, being split into 19 different ninth grade homerooms. And once a month, they're given the opportunity to enter into that. Um, we give them some coaching on Monday. We allow them to practice Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday they go in with um, with the help of that ninth grade homeroom teacher to facilitate um, an SEL lesson. Um, there was a there's an education weekly article back in I think last October that kind of really it, it struck a chord with me because we know that high school kids it's it's not always like oh I, I really want to talk about my social emotional learning that's just something that I'm dying to do sometimes it is a thing where a ninth, a ninth grader may um, feel reserved at first and what we found is that that peer interaction can sometimes be a lot more um, effective and that's what that article um, talked about was that creating like peer coaching opportunities or peer mentoring opportunities is a really strong way for not only the seniors to exercise their leadership but for the ninth grade students to feel a little bit more comfortable that this is something that all students should be doing and this is something that clearly these leaders in our building care enough about to come in to talk to you um, we've had some pretty good success with that um, so far the lessons that have occurred um, we we started off in september focusing primarily on community building um, creating some normed expectations uh, what can we expect from each other uh, and then we have been doing grade specific because we know that a ninth grade student has different needs than a 12th grade student. Um, the ninth grade students have been working with stress and coping and kind of transitioning into high school. How do I deal with some of the new stresses that are coming with me with a more rigorous academic schedule and maybe a more busy extracurricular schedule as well? Uh, the 10th graders have been talking about their mental well being, emotional, um, mental, and social, how they're interacting with others, how they're thinking about their. Um, their kind of mental self-talk. Are they talking to themselves positively? Are they talking to, and then the social, are we talking to each other in a way that's respectable and um, you know kind? The juniors have been exploring uh, values and kind of trying to think about and brainstorm, what do I actually hold true? Um, what, do I, what do I believe about what it means to be a good person? Um, how do I see that playing out both in myself and in the building? Uh, and then the 12th graders have started off by talking about leadership, knowing that they are leaders in our building and that they are people, um, you know, people in the building who the younger students are looking towards. Um, I am, you know, I'm confident that every senior in our building is a is a leader and has leadership potential and what they do and the way that they act and the way that they care about their academics and the way that they respect their teachers and talk to other students and behave in our building truly builds that's where the culture comes from and so 
they're you know, being given some opportunities to explore what does that leadership look like for me. And then one additional piece to add that our SEL committee um, frequently polls staff so we get the staff feedback on um, their comfort level, where we are in the process of, of uh, intertwining in the classroom and um, their, self, their self reflection on ability to do what we ask with SEL learning. And what our staff tells us is um, willingness to do so. We know high school instructors um, sometimes are real content experts, but we'll tell us, but geez, Dave, I, I don't feel as comfortable in that area. So we intentionally take time then to do learning along with the staff to build their comfort and capacity to talk more about SCL um, embedded strategies in the classroom and has also helped lead some of the universal instruction. So we do with along the journey. And as, and as Derek says, it takes time, but universal change takes time. So it's a continuous focus over a period of time and then listening to our learners and adjusting our instruction, therefore. We have some committee members and instructors that feel very comfortable with this work and want to continue to push it forward. Um, when we pulled the staff, every staff member said SEL is important. It's yep. just a, it's a matter of do I feel capable and confident that I am, you know, I'm an expert in being able to lead that type of instruction. So those of us that have been trained and have more, um, you know, just more expertise in that area are certainly doing our work to try to continue to grow that staff competency. And our final slide here just showing you know, the, the interdependency, interdepartment, interdependency of all the levels of district leadership, of teaching and instruction, and the value of the staff and our instructional coaches. I'd like to point out the principles are the smallest of the three here things here. Means. So, so anyway, we're uh, happy to be able to present tonight and we're happy to do any QA at the board. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'll open the floor to any comments or questions or discussion. Representative Lester. Um, I just wanted to add that through Link, like not only with like tips and tricks in the classroom we're helping, I also noticed as a student that there's more of like a unity created just in the student body with like extracurriculars and like clubs and that sort of thing. Like there's been a lot more like representation from the underclassmen because we continue to go back and talk to these students and kind of work with them and show them how the school works. Like beforehand with Link, it used to just be on the first day of school, we would show them around the school, kind of tell them, oh, go to your classes, do your homework, and they kind of just set them free. But now we're continuing to check back and we're continuing to kind of see how they're progressing as the school year goes on. And I've noticed like even in my own clubs, there's like tons of upper class or underclassmen, like more so than upperclassmen. You can just kind of see that like we're moving in the right direction, which I think just shows how it's really benefiting in the school. So thank you. Weisenbeck. Number one, thank you so much. I'm I'm from North, so I don't know how Memorial is implementing these. And with all due transparency, North is doing it slightly differently. But I really appreciate the dedication to students' opinions and thoughts. And I, I feel that a lot of times, although it is said that information is needed from students and that feedback is important, I don't always feel it implemented throughout the school. And I recognize that you guys are trying, and I really appreciate that. And I think that North could use more of that. I think that the peer tutoring and like the peer mentoring from upperclassmen is a very interesting perspective to take. It's not something that North is currently doing, but I think it could be interesting as a way of engagement because right now there is a very, there's a lack of engagement with underclassmen that we're struggling with. So I think it's a very unique perspective and I really appreciate the way that you are trying to facilitate that. and then Dr. Johnson. So uh, I've probably made no, um, you, you know, like I've never hidden the fact that I am a Montessori trained teacher and I love every single thing that you guys said and every single thing that you're doing because I just feel like it is the reason and it's, it's the thing that I found the most benefit from being in a multi-age classroom in Montessori was the older students being able to mentor the younger students and right out of the gate, you know, a small kid comes in, you know, a young student comes in, they don't know what the heck's going on. They just want to rage through the classroom and touch everything and throw it all around. And the older student's like, no, 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 no. You know, and, and so I, and the power of that relationship between older students and younger students, it's really tough 
in the current secondary education structure that we have in our country. It's tough because it is so you're kind of just in this track and you've got this specific, you know, in some schools you have like a hallway that's just your own and you really are kind of isolated from your upperclassmen. And so the work of breaking down some of those, um, you know, decades old institutional struggles that we have in in this education system. Kudos to you for doing it. I'm so happy to hear that. I'm so happy to hear that it's happening and I'm so happy to hear that students are responding um, and and just, you know, I, I think with some things, just keep at it and, you know, keep keep going with it, keep building on it. Um, I'm really curious to see how this continues to grow in the future. So thank you guys for the creativity and the and and going at it. It's exciting. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Sir. We know the Carnegie unit, that traditional way that secondary schools are structured. Some there, there's things it's very good at. Um, systemic change is not always one of them. So we, have, we work with the current reality, absolutely. Dr. Johnson. Uh, thank, you, thank you for the presentation. I, you know, for me, I, I'll definitely uh, be a great opportunity to uh, have a conversation with my ninth grader uh, to see kind of how the upperclassmen interactions are going. Uh, and, but could you could you just speak to and or, uh, you, you know, it, it was mentioned earlier where uh, 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 you're trying to meet your staff where, where, where they are and staff are at different places. What's 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 the measurement of uh, figuring out where staff are? And actually get them there. And then I guess the second second part, and you know, I uh, probably should have a couple more conversations in my in, in my own home. But one of the missing pieces, I guess, for me, continuously with uh, 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 with this particular model, where 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 are those efforts? I would hope are the, are there a group of upperclassmen that are intentional about going into uh, classrooms with students with disabilities? And making potentially making the, those particular uh, you know connections and or where do where, where do potentially uh, 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 the, the 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 student experiences of, 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 of with students with disabilities where does that come into play uh, uh, or you know as is typically it's somewhat of this of this afterthought and I'm I'm just wondering not that you you, you need to have an answer I'm just under wanting to know. Has that been under consideration? Understanding all of this takes time. So I think that, because for me, the always the delivery, and you know, I'm not. Uh, if you can, I guess, follow the recordings here. I'm not the biggest fan of like character strong. It's ma mainly it's just. It's not, yeah, yeah, I know you have. So, so, but the the, the universal delivery uh, amongst it, it, it's not equitable, especially how it's how it's delivered. And so I think that first piece of kind of what what are what are you using. Uh, 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 objectively or tangibly to be able to just kind of gauge the competencies of, of of your staff and being able to deliver uh, 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 it to its minimum effective way. And then it's that piece of where, where are we in our ability to try to actually do a better job of moving or including actually students with disabilities in this overall process? Sure. Well, thank you. I'll talk about the student piece. First, yeah. So, um, thank you for the question. The the first thing is addressing you know students with disabilities. We have, you know, we've we're in constant communication with our special education staff, um, and we, you know, Dan Wilson is our department chair, and we've worked with him to just to um, see which you know, which students are engaging, um, and every student that's able to engage in the you know in those in the standalone sessions is certainly doing that. Um, and we have, you know, we've we've worked, I would agree that I, I wasn't the biggest fan of character strong either. And um, I, I saw issues last year, but we needed to make sure that we were going through um, committee approach. We were going through structural approach that we were working with um, the district and we were making sure that we were trying to find a way to make it as equitable as possible. Um, one way that we've created some of that equity is that kids are now getting a common experience. Um, it's it's in a, a more of a larger group setting, and I'm always in one of those sessions with different staff rotating um, through, which allows all staff, me and my my team of instructional coaches are, are making sure that um, 
each student is getting the same lesson, the same experience um, where last year I can't say with full confidence that that was true. Again, we were just you know trying to roll out phase one of the of the rollout plan. Um, but the important part of what we're doing right now is, as Dave mentioned, we're doing it with right now and we need to continue to push the needle towards um, all staff being comfortable eating, eating that in part of instruction. So Tad intentionally at the beginning of the year in partnering with our, our staff that um, leads special education um, students with with um, you know some specially designed program. Um, wherever able, we're able to we include um, the entire student body in the universal educational um, approach as Derek illustrated before and including staff, including special education staff, special design programming staff in that team teaching opportunity for whole group instruction is an inclusionary practice. Then um, Derek and his team is very intentional then about um, student surveys. So students give us an exit ticket or give us some type of feedback at the end of each lesson to which his team curates and then they um, adjust either pacing or pedagogy or um, did we hit the learning target based on that student feedback? So that's that intentional portion addressing, I think at least a portion of your question on student need, and student design. Regarding staff, so at the end of last year, we polled our staff and 83% of the staff responded that while well, supportive of character strong, they were hoping to be able to do something a little bit more in the large group settings and the team teaching concept that we just talked about. And then the I do, we do, I do, we do process of we do and then we do with them. So we have a large group instruction where the staff member can come in and they can be supporting and they can, they can work with a, a character strong grouping of students then be able to lead a lesson and then be able to go back into classroom and and practice implement in the classroom some of the things they've been able to model and then um practicing the larger group sessions and that's um by and large and that's what the staff survey told us last year so we have another staff survey coming up we the, the last survey we did was at the end of the last school year designed this model and now in short order here within the next few weeks, we'll survey the staff again to give us a dipstick about how the first third of the school year has gone um, and their comfort level, uh, Likert scale of self-reflection, and then we'll adjust accordingly. From there. Initial student data is very strongly leaning towards, they like that the large group setting like for, for, for a multitude of different reasons. We left some uh, ability mm -hmm. for them to leave some open-ended um, results as well. And I think, Part of it was they had a better chance of being with um, a group of students that they were comfortable with because it was the kids that are already in their um, homeroom. The grade, you know, the 11th graders that are in that homeroom are joining and those homerooms are meeting much more regularly this year than they were last year, where it was really more of a once a week kind of thing. So they just feel a little bit more connected so that that connection is um, a way to get them to enter into you know, the, pra the practices. Can I, can I just just follow up? It, uh, so I, I just would request if if there could just be uh, uh, just an effort made as you're uh, potentially what's what's the number of those actual uh, uh, kids with uh, uh, with 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 IEPs or that are that are actually like included or given the shot to actually, and then those that are are are, are not, and then I guess it's it, it's for me my concern are there are there are there other alternatives, and or what do, what what do we potentially do uh, you know about those kids because you know I, I I think the other reality uh, uh, if we're if we're if we don't have a disability, we'll, we're going to age into a disability, and then, you know, and, and until our, our society is actually a little bit more uh, 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 okay that we can just be different, and I think that that that, that opportunity is actually developed now. And so I, I, that's just one of those those those, those pieces for me is just just kind of just kind of seeing where we. Where can we just do a better job of actually the the, the, the inclusion of. Uh, of, of our of our kids with disabilities, and I, and I think that's great given the ability level of some of those students 
with disabilities, if they can be uh, uh, included in those classrooms going. But then there, there's also the, that other set of uh, uh, kids with disabilities that given uh, given the necessary supports that they particularly need, the, the environment, especially the large class, large group environment may not be conducive sure. to them being, a, uh, to those individuals being able to, to benefit from the intentions of care to strong. And so I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious about now whether or not what's the solution, I have no idea, uh, but it's kind of one of those things that let's, let's find, let's have some, uh, some data that tell us this is a percentage of our, of our students with disabilities at the secondary level and are at the elementary level that have ex at least exposure to the experience similar to their peers without disabilities. Thank you. Um, we can quantify and qualify both these yeah. things for you. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Bika. Thank you for the, the very effective presentation. And I'm thinking on the side of district leadership, and I, I hope what I'll say sort of doesn't need to be said, but um, when I think about the staff members responsible for delivering the programs, I hope that they, they are not afraid to ask or to identify the needs that they have to be able to deliver effectively. Not that they're not afraid, they're willing to, or that they are coming forward enthusiastically to say, this is what we need from you, from us, um, that this will actually work because we're formalizing, I think what every educator that's ever been in front of a young person has always known. If the socio-emotional pieces are not in there, are not happening, uh, no development will happen. No, no learning will take place. So I hope that, and we experience that in college teachers. So I see that very much college students, you know, learners of any age. So I hope that we are doing our job in providing your staff members what they really need. And if that goes beyond even what's happening within the district, but to resources outside of the district, whatever is needed to be successful. Absolutely, sure. It's one of the, one of the charges the MLSS gives us is um, strong shared leadership, right? And then the community partnership portion that you, you highlight, and those are the efforts that our community is, our, our committee, sorry, is certainly attuned to an area that we, we continue to grow. So I, I um, appreciate you pointing that out, Dr. Pico. Any other questions, wonderments, directions, requests? Thank you for the presentation tonight. We, uh, I think we'll move on to the next part, but this is a good lead in to our, our uh, monitoring of district results. So thank you both. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. As mentioned, we will move on to our regular monitoring of district policy. Tonight we have OE4 student learning environment for presentation bit. I will turn it over to Superintendent Johnson. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to the uh, previous presenters. Uh, we did want to make that connection with a focus on results, whether it was R3 or um, OE4 this evening. Uh, we had quite a bit of help from uh, various members of the executive team, and I know at least one is remote uh, this evening, but um, out of the nine uh, somewhat sub substandards we had been in compliance in five of those nine uh, first off with uh, 4.1 uh, following all state and federal laws with treatment of students and learning environments were in compliance with exception um, that basically is is pretty heavily because uh, we're in the midst of policy review of policy 411 um, but the other three policies uh, there is some of that data shown to you as well as 522.3 um, the staff yearly verification component um, with this, uh, has gone from 84 to, to 93%, still not at the 100% level, but with uh, work through human resources, as well as um, some up updates with technology, as well as reminders from principals and things, we've increased that number um, from October 31st of last year to October 31st of this year. Uh, for 4.2, um, ensuring safety and supervision, uh, fully in compliance. Uh, that's largely with, with Kim's assistance uh, on 4.2. Just uh, supervision of students during school hours. 
but um, all pieces of transportation by the district to and from school and at school sponsored activities. Uh, for 4.3, uh, you may have seen this a bit in R3 before uh, with some of the links that we had really taken out um, where you didn't need to, to click and link those again, but we just wanted to share those as evidence. Um, you know, while the mental and physical health of the students is addressed throughout each grade's curricula, um, we have the our staff yearly verification process is not at 100%. We want to delete that indicator, not because we weren't compliant or fully compliant, but rather because it's addressed in 4.1. When we went over this as a team, we thought, why would we have this really that same indicator? We thought we would move that um, or, or keep that in, in 4.1 and not have an extra indicator. Uh, for 4.4, uh, K. Marks, Kim Kohler um, had quite a bit of this with disallowing behavior of district employees, volunteers, or visitors uh, that uh, that hinders our student academic performance or well-being. Um, uh, you know, Dang Dang Yang had been instrumental in this over the summer as well. Our employee handbook sections with staff behavior reviewed annually, um, and any misconduct report, and it's shared in the. Uh, uh, shared in the evidence, it's addressed through our HR department. Um, we're in compliance for OE5 um, with our policies and procedures with student behavior, fully reviewed with that equity lens, have stakeholder input and are audited. Uh, that's largely to uh, Kim's work, to Terry Grisb's work, um, as well as some other groups, Dang Yang. Um, so 4.5, we feel that we're in compliance uh, with that. 4.6 uh, student complaints. Again, we put in compliance with exception as 411 is currently under review. Um, with 4.7, uh, collection of student data, data, Mandy Van Vliet, Michelle Radke, uh, we are in compliance, uh, largely unchanged uh, from last year as well. Um, we just wanted uh, to be able to ask for in indicator six if we could switch the director of assessment to the designated department. Um, just seeking permission on that. For 4.8, we're in compliance um, due to assistance from uh, Kim Kohler, from Brian Marks, from the HR team uh, with our district wide training and crisis prevention and management for all safety measures. Uh, and then in compliance with exception for 4.9, um, developing that system with student input in which to measure climate and culture of the district for students, really co uh, collaboratively with Dr. Zhang, uh, with our director of EDI, Dang Yang, with Michelle Radke using um, survey data as well. We wanted to eliminate indicator four as we didn't believe that matches the student in input component of the policy. Um, while all our schools administer administer that student, family, and staff survey and the TFI, and while our, we're working in each one of our schools to address those uh, individually, we are below that target of 95%, and I know it's a lofty goal, but um, we wanted to break that down for you uh, to show you the, the breakdown by grade level and then the, the previous data from the, the previous year. We're not at that indicator's prescribed level. so. That's really in a nutshell from 4.1 through 4.9, and I'll be willing to take some questions and we do have staff available to answer some of the questions or comments, concerns as well. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Johnson. Uh, comments or questions from the board or representatives? Dr. Pika. Mm -hmm. 4.3. I had not linked that to. So for OE 4.9, there's a the, the climate survey. So I and I apologize if I, I just don't remember sort of the evolution of these, you know, to this point, but ensuring that it, you know that the environments that we would want student data for OE 4.3. If you understand what I'm saying, that why we've not linked 4.3 with 4.9, the climate survey, so that there's student data that reinforces that we are in fact achieving this.
so why we would or why why we wouldn't connect four three and four nine or take the data from four nine into four three uh look at you be saying that that data from 4.9 could be used to verify as stronger evidence that students also feel that this is actually happening. That they're actually that the you know evidence from indicator one is having an, its intended effect. Is that am I understanding it right? Is after the fact, could we include that? I mean, as a proviso with the discussion afterward to be able to include that as part of the evidence for 4.3. Well, it shouldn't be listed as things that are missing, you know, for next year and be an update for the following one. I got you, Commissioner. I'm on it. Yeah, the floor is yours. So on uh, 4.7, indicator 6. Disciplinary, I guess, for me, but I also think it speaks to the overall safety. Um, this OE, and I didn't see anything in there when when outside or outside entities come in and make research requests. I didn't see anything there about in the approval process or the internal process about expecting that, that the pro that their project would be approved by an ethics review panel, or what we would call an institutional review board. Or be, yeah. Uh, Ask Michelle if she has background or that or on that, or if we would include for IRB. Yeah, did that, but that is something that we can look into. To do that. And you could say IRB approved, or at least approval is pending. Mm -hmm. That they would there would be no data collection until that approval is in place. Oh, okay. Um, so at 4.3, um, I guess maybe I am sharing similar a uh, lack of something being there um, as Commissioner Bika. Um, but I guess my specific, I feel that perhaps there, the second part of that, of 4.3, um, really speaks to student feeling of, of safety and, and systems and processes that are in place to assure safety for students. And I, I don't, I don't see in here a lot of evidence for that like the indicator feels incomplete to match the um you know to, to match what we're what we're looking to see here i just i i don't i didn't feel like i had quite enough um to show how students and maybe that is maybe that is coming from student data but also what are we doing on our end um uh, you know and, and how are those two things matching up how are what are we doing and how students are feeling how do those work together i just don't quite feel like I see it quite en enough there in the future. I think I'd, I'd like that second part of that um, of that to be a bit stronger. If I could. Um, yeah. Um, so 4.9, this is just more observational than anything. Um, I was just a little bit concerned about the drop in student participation in, in the in the surveys from even pre pandemic to you know, if we just cut that year out, that was a blip on the radar to now. Um, so I will really just be curious to see how we increase student participation um, in that survey moving forward. I know that, you know, both can be tricky when systems change. Um, but uh, from 90 to what was it, 60, 30 percentage drop just like to see that get back up. So we're really capturing, because you know that those those 30 some odd to 4% of the students are probably the ones that we will probably really need to hear from. So I would, I would, um, I'll be interested to see that um, increase. The thing that really caught me um, 
off guard in reading this and I was actually I was sitting on my couch and I just I really kind of like vocalized like whoa is when we got to um when we got to some of the the artifacts that were provided sort of in the appendix to this monitoring report um for indicator for oh for indicator for you had um behavioral incidents you've we've documented behavioral incidents across the district here and I'm just wondering if we can speak to, um, I think the out of school suspension data was shocking to me. Um, and, and I understand we're coming out of the pandemic, but I would really love to hear uh, about what we're doing about that or what some observations might be about that, because that feels, that feels like when, when numbers jump that high, and I understand we're in extraordinary circumstances, that there's something going on behind this, this, um, you know, and this can also be in student success. This might, you know, be a different place where we need to really be paying attention to how we're, how we are, what our student environments look like, because that, those big jumps, then I'm wondering, well, what are, what are we doing wrong and how are we working to improve? And obviously we just heard that. That was very helpful for me to hear that. Um, but, you know, just looking even at like the the days removed for out of school suspensions, it was, oof, that was a tough pill to swallow. So I just wondering if you could maybe speak to that a little bit. I will. I'd like to cue it up a little bit for before Kim Kohler is able to speak. If she's I, I see she's I see she's available. Hopefully she's able to to share. Um, it's shocking to me. It's disappointing to me. I shouldn't say it's shocking. It's disappointing to me, but it's not shocking. When I consult with especially larger school administrators across the state um, with what we share, uh, the behaviors, um, and ultimately, yeah, yes, as a result of the pandemic, when we look at data from 18, from 19, um, there's a reason why learning loss and mental health support for our students is critical. Um, yes, disappointing, absolutely. But, um, you know, with what we've learned from some of our students and what they've had to go through with some of their with their families as well. Um, it is it. To those of us kind of in the business, um, it, it hasn't been shocking, um, but we've really needed every bit of that mental health support in our school psychologists and social workers and counselors. But um, I'd like to to give the floor to Kim right now to share a little bit um, about it. Sure. Kim, are you available? That. Yep, I'm available um, and I'm happy to share. I think um, the important thing to remember is that um, when we look at um, kind of endpoints like suspension data and incident review panels, um, we're really looking at um, the result of um, a situation and um, the fix for the situation or the way to change the situation probably occurred several steps before that. Um, and so when we look at the suspension data and changes in suspension data, especially over the last couple of years, a few things uh, come to mind. First of all, I think it was uh, Representative Lester who said, you know, the the idea that upperclassmen are really showing students, the underclassmen of, at Memorial, what it means to be an old Abe and what it's like to be an old Abe. We lost some of that culture during the pandemic. So as an example, if you think of this year's eighth graders who are the leaders at our middle school, they did not have a typical sixth or seventh grade year. Um, so to define what does it mean to be a knight or what does it mean to be a polar or a falcon, um, they haven't really had that modeled. So what principals are learning is or have learned is that they really need to be intentional about reculturing what it means to what it means to go to school in each of our schools. So that's one thing we know that we're learning. Another thing that we know students are learning is um, how to be um, part of a large group again, how to be a small community at a school. Again, that was something um, that, you know, we just, it was impacted by the pandemic. Pandemic aside, um, when we see suspension data, um, whether it's in-school suspension or out-of-school suspension, 
Um, both of those really are lost instructional minutes, and they're concerning because when a when a child is suspended, we are suspending their right um, to an education, um, and so they're not receiving instruction, and that's a concern for us. So, um, like Dr. Zhang. Um, explained earlier today, this is really about systems. What are we putting in place to help students and intervene at the lowest level possible, the lowest level of intervention as early as possible so that it doesn't, um, it whatever we're seeing doesn't continue to grow or um, end up manifesting in uh, an out of school or an in school suspension. So how do we develop um, rules, data rules, so that when we see A, B, or C in a student, even though A, B, or C may not result in a suspension, it is kind of a flag for us to say that child might need more support, and how do we get that support early so that it doesn't result in a suspension later on? Thank you. So one, one thing that I see as missing, that I'd like to see happening on future reports this cycle, but especially next cycle. And I, I, we've talked about this in agenda setting a few times, but I just want to have it on the one thing I, I think is necessary to see is more indication of from the superintendent on the progress that the district is making explicitly from year to year on meeting compliance. There was a little bit of that in the reference to you know moving up the, uh, the what was the process called the verification process that that helped me to remember Oh, right, that last year it was at this amount and now it's moved up so I can see progress even if there's still an exception there. I think one of the things like that it causes me to have to look back at, at last year's and try to figure out have we made progress? Um, you know, the what we're hopefully moving toward, especially in the OEs, is full compliance on every uh, indicator or on at least every sub point. And it would, I, I think it would be very helpful to me and Maybe to others, if we had an easier way to reference where are the growth areas, uh, especially when that moves from you know in compliance with exception to full compliance. I mean, full compliance is great, but I want to know. Yeah, we hit three more benchmarks this year, and, and we we're getting there. Perhaps once we've achieved full compliance, that won't be necessary because we'll be there. But and then that would also go to some of the other things that like Commissioner Zerb brought up, and looking at you know we have some of these charts that do list the years so we can see the year by year progress on that but one thing that i've just found myself lacking uh wanting as i've looked through the oes for this cycle is more explicit instruction to me so i don't have to go back and say or uh discussion not instruction to say this is the places that we've made progress this is where we didn't make progress and are still at an exception without moving it forward i think that would be helpful so i just wanted that on the record at the end just in this context. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the, the progress that is being made and I, you know, I, I'm content with the report. I appreciate my colleagues' suggestions. Dr. Johnson? <clears throat> was, was there a uh, what has happened to the other uh, you know, student characteristics as it pertains to like the suspension data? Is that captured somewhere? Is that captured somewhere else? I, I, I see the panel review characteristics are provided for, for the uh, uh, incident panel review data has the student characteristics, but do, do we have the student characteristics for the, the suspension data this, uh, this year? So, so like, in here, it's uh, gender, uh, special education status, and then like like ethnicity. You know, uh, did we for the incident review panels? Those characteristics are present. Like I, I guess I didn't, I wasn't seeing because one of the one of, one of the things that you know, Commissioner Zur spoke to, uh, I, I guess the alarming rate or the number of of, of suspensions. Um, you know, I. 
the, the number is also important, but also who's, who's made up in that particular number is even more important, especially if we find ourselves given the uh, potentially lower percentage of students of color and or a higher percentage of actually students with disabilities who find themselves there. And that, uh, to me, uh, speaks to speaks to some behavior components, but, all, but also speaks to probably some more uh, professional development about uh, approaches to how 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 we're uh, dealing with uh, behavior. The other point I I will bring up at this particular time, but however, I, I would like to uh, those, those those characteristics cannot be uh, uh, omitted, even if they tell actually an undesirable story. And, and, and so, um, realities are realities, um, and we 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 have to do our best to improve the uh, the everyday realities of actually the students who are uh, uh, going. Uh, going to school and all, and, and all of those students. So if if that could be, or if it's somewhere else, just point me in the direction of where uh, where it is. But I I, I I thought the you know including the the, the characteristics how you had for the number of incidents the, the that panel review. I thought that 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 was a good breakdown. I would like to see the same moving forward. Actually for. Uh, for for the suspensions as well that breakdown um, and uh, you know I think specifically um, you know the special education status piece and then the eth uh, you know ethnicity piece uh, the the gender piece doesn't surprise uh, obviously females are a superior species starting at an earlier age and so I think the behavioral that that didn't actually but I think we still we still need it to kind of from an equity uh, equitable standpoint but I would really unless is it somewhere else did I did I did I miss it there. Do we have a for the IRP for well go ahead Kim. I was going to say I can respond to that. So we know that we are disproportional um with our suspensions. And I in fact I think we were officially flagged um by the DPI for um suspensions and certainly executive director Van Vliet can can talk about exactly what that um what flag that was for, but I believe it was related to special education and suspension. Um, I I absolutely can can break that data down and would be happy to do that. Um, and if you'd like it before next year's report, we can certainly do that. Or I can make a note to um, ensure that it's it's broken down in the next monitoring report. Yeah, whichever one is sooner. I I, I think uh, okay. that would be that would be great. And also, uh, uh, given the information that was actually just shared, actually highlighting uh, the, the 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 flagging of pieces. And so, uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, whichever whichever happens sooner, if that could be I think, included. I think the soonest um, the the sooner of the two options would be for. Um, our department just to take the information that was shared in the report tonight, um, the same numbers, the same students, and break down that exact information um, and and um, get you that report. So I will I will do that. And, and, and once again, for me, it's it, this is this is uh, uh, you know I, I you know if on our school district page actually says that we've decided to make a commitment. Uh, 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 to 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 to, the, to all EDI efforts, uh, and this is uh, uh, one that uh, you know we 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 need to continue to uh, to strive towards. Uh, and my, I, I guess I'm not going to apologize for being one to bring it up, but I probably should not have. I you know that puts an additional uh, email or two coming into my inbox, but it's a. Uh, it is fine at this particular time, but yeah, if we could, if we could just get that, I, you know, I, I and what we're trying to do is tell a story, and then how do we actually make that story better, and you know, and 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 make the learning experience better for the students that are impacted, but also uh, uh, ensure that our our our, our staff uh, who work hard on a daily basis potentially could get some additional resources they need to actually enhance that learning experience. Thank you. I was going to piggyback on that, Dr. Johnson, that this does continue to be one of the things that we want to focus on is always having that breakdown always in all of these things. And then to go back onto my point, you know, not only 
would we like to see it with this data? But then when it comes to again to next year's monitoring report, I'd like to see this year's data and the you know the current year's data so that we're having that year by year look so that we can continue to monitor, especially areas where the district does need to make progress. So, uh, you know, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for bringing it up. And I think you've spoken to the hearts of all of the board members by saying that we want to see this information even when it's hard to see. And I think, you know, Commissioner Zer, you've talked about that point before as well. Seeing no other current requests for comments, I would hear a motion to approve the OE4 Student Learning Environment Monitoring Report. So moved. Yeah. You, any discussion on the motion? None, we'll call the question. All those in favor of approving the OE4 Student Learning Environment Monitoring Report? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The report is approved. Uh, Commissioner Zur, if you could share with us the summary notes so that I can just yes. an accurate statement. Sure, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so um, no strengths were really shared, however, it was approved. Weaknesses, um, Dr. Bika in 4.7.6, felt uh, I, I just I noted that um, the comment about it being a discipline heavy um, and additionally uh, show use of IRB approval language prior to data collection. Is that correct? Oh, I, you can delete the part about discipline. I meant oh. it's disciplinary to as a psychology professor. You you just strike that part. Oh, yes. <laughs> Struck. <laughs> I didn't know if I was getting in the weeds. That's what I meant. Is the, is the oh is the second portion of that correct? Yeah. Um, omissions, a Lori Bika student data um, could, be, could or should be used as an indicator to show compliance um, in 4.3, use data from 4.9 um, to, uh, yeah, to show compliance for 4.3. Those are my very basic notes. Um, I stated that I would like additional information in 4.3 related to the second portion of the indicator on uh, student feelings of safety in future monitoring reports. Um, Dr. Nordine would like to see more progress um, towards compliance in linear year over year. Uh, sorry, this I was typing while listening and that's never good. Um, uh, for future monitoring um, towards full compliance would be helpful on all future OEs. Um, Mark Wall Johnson, Dr. Johnson said to, um, when providing student data, um, be sure to provide characteristic data um, so the board can monitor success of systems in relation to various populations, ethnicity, gender, special education status. If anything is flagged, be sure to inform the board. Um, Dr. Nordine, additionally, when data is provided, looking at it year over year. Thank you, Commissioner. Sir, if you could email that to me this evening as I'm traveling the next week and I want to get this uh, summary statement out before I head out. So thank you very much. Uh, maybe not right now because you're about to be called upon again. Uh, we'll now move on to our final main segment of the night. That is our board development and an update on our communication plan work. I'll turn that over to you, Commissioner Zer. Sure. Uh, my apologies for this taking so long to come back to us. So really what I took away from our last conversation was that some of the different moving components of the communication plan felt like maybe they needed a little bit more um, massaging, but that the communi key communicator group seemed like something we wanted to try and lift off the ground. Um, I did have some follow-up discussions with uh, a couple of different board members from Sun Prairie um, and did talk with Terry Piper Thompson about, you know, just some ideas for where we could start with that list. I also used the list for the referendum advisory, community advisory group that Dr. Bika worked really hard on um, in formating or in form, uh, formulating sort of a, a starting list of like, here's all the people that kind of, um, you know, would network out to. However, there's probably omissions in there that if, you know, if board members were to feel that they wanted to add to that prior to any official invitation or request being sent out. Um, 
uh, we, you know, we could absolutely do that. So that list, I believe, was provided in executive content to you. Um, so what I did was kind of took the communication plan and just popped it in here. So um, in in looking through um, our coherent governance text and just seeing, you know, reviewing what the recommendations are for this group, what Sun Prairie has done, um, you know, this is kind of the, the proposal um, is, is just to launch the key communicator group. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's just really all I have for tonight. If there's any questions about it or further discussion about it, we've talked about it so much, I don't want to berate it or anything. I think that I see it as an opportunity, hopefully for us to kind of come to consensus, sort of like we do in our work sessions of like, how do we move this forward? So I'm I'm hopeful that tonight we can we can talk about as a group, what's the next step for it? Are we, are we ready to go? Um, before I open the floor, I just want to express my thanks to you, Commissioner Zer, for your continued focus on this, as well as Dr. Farrar and Commissioner Lyons. I know you participated on these as well, Dr. Biga, you know, but um, this is important work and it, it does take someone to, to do that sort of outside of our regular meeting time to keep it moving forward. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of that work that you've done, Commissioner. Uh, you know, comments, questions, discussion, where do we want to go with, with key communicators at this point? Yeah, I, I, I'm, it, it, it makes sense. I'm, I'm in support of the group. Uh, in 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 selection, I I I I, I, I like the, the the wording here. We uh, will have to uh, ensure that uh, you know uh, not only is representation from historically uh, historically marginalized communities, but also um, um, that all individuals uh, sharing a particular perspective have an opportunity to. To be uh, to, to to be select uh, be selected, but also being mindful of, you know, I, I think uh, uh, group group di group dynamics, and so you know, I, I think that's really something that we just have to be conscientious about in terms of the the selection committee. And my apologies for fumbling of trying to be as uh, uh, I think uh, as politically correct as possible and trying to ensure. That it's this. This has to be all encompassing, right? And you know, I think uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the school, uh, some of the sec. I know some of the secondary schools and some of the the way that they bring uh, bring parents in have done a pretty good job of having a uh, you know a wide mix. I know, uh, you know where my uh, where my my daughter attends middle school. Uh, it's a pretty you know eclectic group of uh, uh, some parent uh, parent groups there, and so. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think as long as structure and organization, which already is laid out here, that was the other piece that I kind of, it kind of gave a, a rundown of pretty much kind of what a meeting already would look like. So you can't bring other things into the into the mix. So I I I, I really like that, and, and so uh, that would just be my that we really kind of uh, go through all the channels of ensuring that everyone had an access of being a part of it. Uh, uh, and therefore, we can minimize uh, uh, or hope to minimize criticism and our complaints uh, with the group once it's formed. I think that is the piece that I feel, sorry, just to talk without being wrecked, it's not what we're okay. meeting. Um, I think that that's the, the piece that I feel um, perhaps I don't want to say concern. I feel I think I think I feel most concerned about the actual manifestation of the group and then also that they feel like there's enough for them to do that they want to continually be involved you know what i mean because the last thing you want is to start with a bunch of enthusiasm and then have a bunch of people drop off and then what is the system for replacing those people do you replace those people i'm more concerned about the logistics of that actual formation because time is very precious and these folks are um, on everyone's involved list because they're involved people and that is something that um you know, I, I want to be really mindful of and and I do feel like, you know, in conversation with Sun Prairie, that was a struggle for them is and, you know, um, Terry Piper Thompson had great advice for, um, you know, related to approaching um, an organization 
not necessarily a person. So, you know, what is the viewpoint of a certain, you know, what is the group that you're trying to get? And then maybe it's, it doesn't need to necessarily always be a person, but you're just, you know, there's just different pieces of a pie you're trying to, and it doesn't have to be the same person every time. So that was kind of a nice shift in my brain um, of how that could look. But I do feel like that part is not clear yet, is how, how would we appoint those folks? How would we let those people apply or would we recruit, would we open it? I, you know, I don't, I don't know the process there. I think we should get it off the table. I, I think it looks good and and let's let's get it rolling. You know, let's learn from what we're um and, and launch it. I agree. Uh Commissioner, sir, my a question for you is um you know you just talked about the process of sort of recruitment and appointment, etc. When would you envision uh, the first meeting? You know, you've got the recommended meeting schedule, so that gives you, you know, some, which sounds very reasonable. One of my concerns with the whole, with any of these is, you know, how much work are we putting on board members or community members or whatever? And I think you've moderated that in, in a way that doesn't, at least when I read it, feel overwhelming to me to think about. So thanks for that. But so, I, I mean, I, I agree. And I think, you know, if, if the board agrees, I would like to put it on our board consent agenda on the 28th. Uh, to, to just approve and and formally be able to sort of say, yep, we're starting this. Um, but when might you envision trying to target for the first get together? Um, I mean, I, obviously, you know, February and May would be more. Nothing's going to happen, I think, this fall yet. And there needs to be time to put it together. Um, you know, what's really nice about um, our coherent governance text is they give you a great first meeting agenda. You know, it's it's right there. I think what what um, comes after that is is the tricky part and what will take time and what I believe, um, you know, will take a bit of stumbling through and bumbling through to try to get right. Um, but I I think that the information will will just be really valuable if we can structure it well. So. Um, you know, in the interest of, I guess, or for fear of losing a momentum over the summer months, which can you know easily happen in this business. Um, you know, I, I would we could try to have a, a meeting in February. However, you know, calendars are already full in February, which is but we could I mean, we could try it. Um, you know, and then and try to meet again in, in May, but I'm not. I'm not sure yet. I guess it would depend on how recruitment would go and, and what it would look like. We don't have to have a hard date. I, it was more of a curiosity issue for how soon maybe you thought. Second semester? <laughs> How's that sound? I mean, <laughs> I, I hope it can get, I mean, I'm excited to to yeah, get this off the ground, but I, you know, everything is a process of building. So I don't, yeah. I don't want you or whoever, you know, ends up stepping up to work with you or in place of you on you know, to feel like, well, we have to get it done by this time. I'd rather have it, you know, be thoughtful, be intentional about getting people. And would, if that takes a little extra yeah. time, then that is better. Yeah. But. I would like to maybe have more time to be intentional about about what each of those meetings might, you know, because I have a feeling that what we're going to hear is uh, there'll be a lot of, you know, um, feedback from the community. And then I think what, you know, in, in my view of it, what we'll probably have to do is is figure out how to structure that within our monitoring calendar so that we're hearing or 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 sort of speaking the same language at the same time um, so that those conversations are sort of structured around what would benefit the board um, while taking into consideration what the community wants to talk to us about so um you know that might take a bit more time than what february would allow i don't recruitment plus you know trying to get you know so may probably is the more realistic date um, but certainly this school year. There are objections to putting it on a consent agenda. I'm not hearing, I think it. 
So Terry, if you could just make a note of that, we'll just put it on board consent for the 28th and then uh, commissioners are welcome you to figure out next steps and how you want to, who you want to collaborate with to, to keep it moving forward. And, you know, obviously you've already got Dr. Farr and Commissioner Lyons on board. So, but thank you for this work. Um, thanks. I, I don't know how to, I can say it a lot of times, but I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Uh, I'm also grateful that you're about to lead our debrief for the evening for us to reflect on our performance as a board during this meeting. Yeah. Uh, sure, Dr. Johnson. Uh, yeah, so what went well is actually our student representatives. Wow, way to go. A little bit more of this, actually less of us talking, more of you all talking. That was great to uh, 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 have you share your perspective, but really because I, I think for, you know, I, I, I was looking over there wanting to see if you were writing anything down because the best thing is to sometimes actually just uh, 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 call out, especially like a principal. No, but yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was really, it was really a great, uh, just for you all to share your feedback and your experience. And then also the, to see the stark contrast potentially of what's happening at one and then to try to, I, I, I think that's great. So more of that, uh, the, the better, you know, I think uh, for me, just continuing just to kind of understand this uh, uh, process as we're, we're getting focus on results and our approving monitor uh, monitoring reports, just this this piece, it seems like at some point in time, you would hope that uh, 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 you didn't miss that this wasn't included and or you didn't miss that uh, you needed to add this on that potentially there, there, there's some level of uh, consistency that it's understandable by all and you know and, and that that exists and so those are those things that still have to have to come thank you sure lines uh i also was going to say bravo to the students that uh really like to hear from you um and Yours is a voice that uh, I think carries you know, a lot of a lot of bodies. Um, you're here representing uh, your schools, and uh, I, I would like to hear from you more. Um, and thank you for listening to my musings on on budget. Um, you know, I, I think back. I had two kids that went through um, the, the district and I have one that is uh, a student now. And I do really feel very strongly about these increments because my kids, um, you know, it, Soma Pierce had such a strong impact on my middle son when it comes to music. And to think that, that the compensation is just static and hasn't changed. I, I, I feel very strongly about that. And I thank you for you know listening to my my comments on that. As far as I think the thing that we're doing that, that struck me is that we did well tonight and that we want to keep working on is uh, the way that each of us, uh, but really I think each of you all, uh, I didn't as much that I felt I needed to comment on are, are really digging in and trying to make sure that we're doing the work of looking at, you know, what are our needs to make sure that we can assess the district's progress accurately and compare that with the superintendent's progress, trying to find those ways and trying to keep that accountability on to what Dr. Johnson said, trying to get to that level of uniformity where we don't have to keep bringing up, we need this broken out into, but I think that is something that we're, you know, was one of the discussions we had as we went into this form of governance was, well, how do we make sure that we're keeping accountability, keeping it change? And I think we're finding our legs in, in doing that. I, you know, I see each of you bringing different perspectives and, and items, and that includes sometimes, you know, when you're in the minority, you're bringing it up, but that, that you have this, like, I want to make sure that we get a chance to talk about this rather than just passing it through on consent. So uh, I appreciated that as well. And I think it's incumbent on us. That's part of our responsibility now is how do we make sure that we take our responsibility to keep that accountability in check and focus on 
really student outcomes. Which I think is something that we as a group need to continue to work on to really put our focus there on our, our what's happening for our students. Thank you. Also, just really appreciated hearing from both of you today. Um, I'm, I think that's, we all probably just feel that way uniformly, but it's really great to hear student voices. Um, it helps us to make sense of data when we also can, can talk to the two of you, the kind of voices of your schools. Um, I just appreciate, again, the level of detail of all my colleagues on the board, the, the level of care that everyone is approaching these documents with. Appreciate that. All I have to say. Uh, two strengths, I think, and this is unfolding over many years, I think, for me, but the quality of the reports coming forward, like from executive team or building administrators and building staff members like we saw tonight, but we have been seeing like very regularly. So I think we are doing our work so then you are able to talk with us at that higher level. That's that's an evolution, and it's a, it's just a really strength the way that these reports are going. Um, the other thing I uh, appreciated about uh, this is also an evolution. It's not just tonight, but it happened very well tonight. Is the dovetail the focus on results with the train? So, and I don't I'll quite know how that you know, like got set in motion in the way that it is now, but I think it's working really well. You know, I would agree. Those you took but the words right out of my mouth, Dr. Pika. Those were my um, two observations. Um, I think that the, the, the fact that the, the, the presentations from um, the team is are, are up at our, our policy monitoring level is just is so wonderful because it really does help. I think um, these these documents are really void. Of, of narration in a lot of ways, like they're void of, of storytelling of, you know, what's happening behind the scenes of this data and what is the what is the work that's being done and the progress that's being done to, to actually make these things happen. And the fact that we were able to hear that um, tonight right alongside the monitoring report was a big strength for me. I think for me, it's just how do we get how do we we have those great presentations and and retain that information for when we are going? You know, maybe we're not monitoring that thing or that's not relevant at that time. How do we hold that and, and keep that for when for when we are having that conversation um, later on? And that's just my own observation. When the presentation doesn't necessarily match the monitoring, like if we were monitoring like OE eleven or something tonight, it would be very different. So. Um, you know, that's just. Oh, Commissioner Clements, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. So I also thank the our student reps um, for your for your comments. Um, obviously, we're not in the buildings and we don't see how that dynamic works and your insight is really critical. Um, I think one thing that worked well, although I didn't catch the whole of the comments because I arrived a little late, but um, Commissioner Lyons, your your comments about the budget that pertains to certain duties in the district and how does that work with our governance model? I think those are that was a good conversation to to bring up. Although, you know, I I, I felt like is this, is this a conversation we should be having from a governance perspective? But I I generally agreed that it was a conversation to be had. So, um, I'm not entirely certain how we handle these situations as they arise but um i think that's that was a a good discussion to to bring up so i'm glad that that, that occurred um otherwise i think from the the reports um just appreciating how much they've they've improved and changed and how uh fellow commissioners have been asking the questions about show you know show us the data that the difficult uh, inconvenient data that we do have um, so that we have the whole picture. And so I'm glad that that um, those comments were shared so we can make sure that that going going forward, all of that is laid on the table for us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. At this point, I would hear a motion to adjourn. 
All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Adjourned. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the Eau Claire Area.